All right, good morning. This is a joint meeting with Senate Health and Welfare and House Health Care. It is March 31st. Um, and then we are today looking at the waiting list, uh, wait list report, not, not W E I G H T, but W A I T uh, report that has come to us. And we have the folks who can share with us exactly what's in the report. Um, and because it's a joint meeting, I'm going to just introduce myself briefly, Senator Ginny Lyons, Chair of Health and Welfare. And then, um, Bill, did you want to say something? Uh, just that I think we're, it's good to be able to hear the report directly from the folks who are involved. Perfect. All right. This is great. And so why don't you um, go right ahead with uh, bringing us up to date with what's in the report, a brief overview, and, and then uh, I, I don't know how you have your testimony organized, but we're, we're ready to listen. We have an hour and we look forward to it. Thank you. For the record, Ina Backus, Director of Healthcare Reform Agency of Human Services. And if I may, I'd like to ask my colleagues to introduce themselves as well. So, yeah, sure. I'll start. We have a few DFR representatives on here that I think are, are well known to the committee, but I'm Mike Pichak, the commissioner at the Department of Financial Regulation, and I'll turn it over to Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Brown. I'm the director of insurance regulation at DFR. And Sebastian? Mm, my name is Sebastian Arduango, and I'm an assistant general counsel at DFR, and I'll turn it over to Isaac. Hi, good morning. This is Isaac Dano, Special Assistant at DFR, and I will turn it over to Susan. Good morning. I'm Susan Barrett. I'm the Executive Director of the Green Mountain Care Board. Thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, we really do appreciate it, and we look forward to hearing about the report. Thank you. And we're going to share some slides to walk through the report, and um, we'll put those up on the screen now. Uh, who needs to screen share? Can we do that? Well, I need to know who needs to screen who share. Who needs to screen share? Oh, uh, I will be screen sharing those slides. I see. Okay. okay. And right. while that's in pro process, I'll get started. There have been reports of long wait times for healthcare services in Vermont uh, for a number of years, both prior to the pandemic as well as during the pandemic. Late in the summer of 2021, um, reports again uh, about long wait times were featured in the media um, and our respective agencies, the Department of Financial Regulation, the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Human Services had also been hearing anecdotally about long wait times for healthcare services in the state of Vermont. Former Secretary Smith asked that the Agency of Human Services conduct an assessment of these long wait times in the state of Vermont for healthcare services. And in order to do so, we invited the participation and collaboration of our colleagues at the Green Mountain Care Board and the Department of Financial Regulation uh, because of their particular expertise and experience um, with this issue and the different angles uh, of approach that they would bring to the project. Specifically, the Green Mountain Care Board has been uh, asking hospitals to report information in their budget processes about wait times for healthcare services. And the Department of Financial Regulation uh, regulates the healthcare um, uh, commercial insurance uh, networks in the state. Again, uh, these reports of long wait times for healthcare services um, are are not are not new. They have been um, circulating for a number of years. Um, and in order for us to assess this issue, we started by prioritizing and wanting to understand the issue uh, through the lens of Vermonters who were waiting for these services specifically. And in, in doing so, we held a number of public forums and invited written testimony on the issue. 
And here you can see uh, some of the information that we heard from Vermonters in undertaking this assessment. We know that there is uh, evidence that long wait times for clinically appropriate care can lead to worse health outcomes, um, especially for those who are older and more vulnerable. There's also an emotional impact when um, persons are waiting for care or unable to receive care that they need in a timely manner. And this is a particular theme, as you could see from the previous slide that surfaced um, as we were speaking with and trying to understand this issue through the eyes of Vermonters. And we certainly know that research and, and understand the research that patient satisfaction declines when there are longer wait times. There's also a financial impact from delayed care. Um, when care is delayed, uh, the individuals whose care has been delayed may get sicker. Uh, and eventually when they do receive care, that care is more complex to administer and more costly. And there is an equity impact. Uh, barriers to care disproportionately affect those who may not have the time, resources, or knowledge to navigate a complicated medical system. We set out in this assessment uh, collectively to better understand and document the reports of wait times that were, we were hearing uh, in the state of Vermont. There were not, um, it, there's limited data available about wait times for healthcare services nationally, and there's limited literature to consult in terms of wait times uh, for care. Further, there's no agreed upon standard for tracking wait times. Uh, whether in the state of Vermont or, or nationally in the United States. There are a few organizations that offered some different metrics uh, for tracking wait times, and we did consult with that information, and it informed our assessment of the wait times for healthcare services in the state. Again, there is, uh, this is an issue that has not been uh, systematically monitored um, in, in the state of Vermont. We don't have a single entity that is responsible for monitoring and tracking the wait time, wait times for healthcare services in the state. In the state. So th this study was really a first step in trying to identify and take a more systematic and standardized approach to understand wait times for healthcare services in the state. And this study was also a broader study than looking at the wait times, for instance, for hospital services, which had the hospitals, as I mentioned, have been reporting information about wait times for services to the Green Mountain Care Board, but we had not, um, there was no information that was being gathered prior to this initial study about the wait times for services offered by uh, independent practices and independent providers that are not employed by a hospital. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Commissioner Pichek, who will walk the committee through the work that our group collaboratively undertook to better quantify and understand this problem uh, in the state of Vermont. Yeah, thanks, Ina. And, and again, thank you both to the um, to the House and, and Senate committees. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you and, and uh, go through the report and interested in hearing your questions uh, as well. So as Ina said, there were you know, limitations and, and challenges to try to find data that already existed or even, you know, consistent or uniformly applied wait time metrics. So when we set out to try to, you know, quantify the problem, you know, we really were starting from the reporting that we had heard in seven days. You know, there were really concerning stories um, in the seven days article published back uh, late last summer. Um, we wanted to basically open up the platform, uh, invite Vermonters to tell us their stories uh, and see from those public comments, you know, what we heard, how pervasive the issue was. Uh, we then did the same thing with the provider community and then did some analysis around 
um, you know, data uh, on claims. Uh, we did a secret shopper program that replicated the experience of a Vermonter calling and trying to schedule a, a specialty. Uh, and then we also looked at the blueprint for health um, uh, data to try to understand, again, what some of the wait times were that, that individuals were experiencing between uh, a primary care referral uh, and the um, specialty visit. So uh, those are the ways we quantified it. I'll go through each of them in detail, um, but I do think the way we approached it was trying to sort of understand, you know, we have, we have some stories, how much broader is the issue by trying to listen to the public, uh, then went to the provider community, you know, which sees, um, you know, dozens and hundreds of, of individuals on a regular basis. And, you know, what was the perspective from there, and then broadening it out further uh, to trying to uh, collect data and analyze it uh, and do the best we could at trying to make some determinations around um, wait times in Vermont. So as it relates to the public comment uh, section, you can see there that we had two, we had two different public listening sessions. We had 70 participants collectively in those two different listening sessions. We also heard from Vermonters, uh, 68 patients and caregivers uh, that responded with their stories around um, you know, wait times. And as Ina already alluded to and showed some examples of, you know, we really heard from these over 100 people about the material impact to their health and well-being um, that uh, that came from uh, that came from delayed medical care. They described physical, psychological uh, pain. Um, at least a third of the individuals we heard from uh, said that um, you know that they were experiencing pain while waiting for the care that was delayed, and 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 were fearing uh, declining health as a result. You know, they they described bureaucratic hurdles that they experienced in, in trying to make uh, referrals for specialists, in particular. A complex referral process, uh, different forms for different departments, imaging and testing uh, requirements before an appointment could be scheduled. So, for example, someone that does have a primary care physician that does get a referral, if there is some lab work or, or imaging work that needed to be conducted, that needed to be scheduled first. And once that was completed, then they were able to schedule the specialty. And um, that just added some delay into getting that final specialty appointment. They complained about communication between, you know, their, their, the hospital and, and um, their primary care physician that was making the referral or themselves. Uh, in particular, and, and as WCAX has, has recently shed more light on, um, we heard directly from Vermonters about the difficulty in accessing psychiatric and eating disorder services, and, and both of those, particularly for, for children, uh, being a, a concern. So um, if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll just show a little bit again what, what the provider, what we heard from the provider community. So we did the same sort of approach. We had some um, listening sessions that broke up out over three different days. You can see there 20 uh, primary care physicians, 12 specialists, five mental health providers, um, and eight referral coordinators were part of these provider listening sessions. Uh, we also had some provider emails that came to us and there was a survey of providers as well, asking them specific questions around wait times and um, their experiences within the system. So, you know, the, the, the themes that we heard here, uh, probably not all that surprising uh, to the two committees, but uh, they described uh, workforce challenges, uh, shortages of, of workforce, whether that's both administrative workforce, um, but also uh, provider shortages, uh, high turnover among both of those, um, you know, providers and administrative staff, uh, recruitment challenges as well uh, were some of the items described by um, the providers. So um, we also heard, you know, issues relating um, to the consolidation of specialty services at certain hospitals. Um, they believed that uh, it was reducing the ability uh, for some Vermonters to be seen at regional hospitals, which is putting more pressure uh, on UVM in particular, but putting more pressure on certain hospitals uh, compared to others. Um, there's also a theme that we heard from specialists primarily that um, there was uh, maybe instances where primary care doctors were referring uh, to specialists that may be unnecessary from their opinion, uh, which was adding to more workload 
and making it more challenging for specialists to see uh, the appropriate um, you know, specialist for the for for an issue that needed urgent or quick attention. We also heard the inverse from primary care physicians that they were concerned specialists were holding on to patients for too long uh, and not sending them back to primary care, which was putting burden on specialists to see new patients and to get those scheduled in a relatively um, you know quick amount of time. So we we heard that sort of from both perspectives. Uh, we heard concerns around administrative duties in, in offices, um, entering information into, um, into the system, um, work around prior authorizations. Basically, we heard individuals from these offices saying that they were doing more administrative work now than they had a decade ago and seeing fewer patients. So they were saying that was a challenge both from you know a revenue standpoint they had to hire more people to do more work but they were seeing fewer patients but then also of course creating some pressure on the availability of time slots for um for specialty care uh you know in in particular so um if we go to the next slide i'll i'll sort of talk a little bit more about the claims data analysis so those were the two analyses that that we did that were more anecdotal in nature. Obviously, we were hearing from Vermonters uh, who came up and, and had um, something that they wanted to share with us. We were hearing from providers. Similarly, uh, we tried to do a survey to get a broader array of, of providers. So, you know, we were limited to these universes of individuals, although numbering over, you know, 100, 200 people, um, it wasn't sort of the hard data that we were really, you know, trying to get. Uh, to better quantify the problem. So the way um, that we try to approach this issue um, is that we had three separate analyses that we conducted um, and three separate teams conducted each of the analyses. Uh, we had first the claims analyses that Oliver Wyman, uh, outside actuarial firm that we hired uh, to help us with this study uh, conducted, uh, looking at um, a subset of uh, patient records from vital or from VCures rather um, and, and I can get into that a little bit more in a moment. We did a secret shopper program, again, trying to replicate the experience of Vermonters looking to schedule appointments, and then looked at the blueprint for, for health, uh, you know, a chart survey uh, audit and trying to understand, again, were there certain specialties where wait times were longer? Uh, were those wait times appropriate if we could measure that? Um, and the three different analyses, I would say, each had their strengths and their limitations. Um, they also each, in some ways, reconciled with each other in terms of wait times being long, generally, for certain specialties in, in Vermont. So I think that part of it was a strength. Um, but I'll get into each of sort of the strengths and the weaknesses of each of these analyses as we go through them. So if we go to the first one, the first one was the claims data analysis that I mentioned. So Oliver Wyman, uh, was looking at data um, from 2016 to 2020. Um, they excluded the 20 data uh, in terms of doing this analysis, so it really was focused on pre-pandemic. Um, and they were looking at uh, VCURE's claims data for certain um, individuals with chronic conditions. So some of those examples are asthma, anxiety, heart disease. They're looking for people that would regularly need to see a primary care physician and who would be regularly seeing a specialist as well to try to identify um, the amount of time uh, between when a patient saw a primary care physician uh, for a specific specialty diagnosis, and then when they were able to see a specialist for that same diagnosis. So that was the approach that they took uh, in terms of uh, trying to identify a subset of patients that you know were recently diagnosed with a specific issue and needed to see a specialist um, for additional uh, treatment. So they only included situations where there was a, a clear linkage between the primary care and the specialty appointments. Um, they uh, excluded anything that didn't have the same diagnosis code. Um, and then they used um, some of their proprietary uh, matching modeling that looked at uh, what would be a peer state among these 12 or 13 states that we have here in New England. So they looked at states that had similar um, demographics uh, as Vermont, 
they included a subset within those states that had a demographic that looked even more like the Vermont demographic. Um, they looked for chronic condition prevalence uh, and the, and the uh, mix of all of those things together. So essentially, if they were able to find a 44-year-old man that had just been diagnosed with diabetes, um, they went out and found within these other states um, a 44-year-old man that had been recently diagnosed with diabetes that was, you know, needing to go see specialty care. So of the, you know, subset of patients that they were able to identify in Vermont, I believe it was around three or 4,000, uh, they then created a population from these peer states that mimicked Vermont uh, and um, tried to make it as apples and apples in that way. Uh, so basically what we were left with was this Vermont population looking at the subset that had chronic conditions. And then we had a population that was created out of all of these peer states uh, to look like Vermont and then measured how quickly were individuals going from their primary care doctor to a specialist in Vermont and how quickly was that happening in a peer state uh, as well. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see um, generally the appointment time in Vermont. This is not comparing us to other states, but this is just looking um, at Vermont. And what uh, Oliver Wyman found is that pre-pandemic, you know, the, the average days between that primary care visit and the follow-up specialist visit was about 100 days. And that was pretty consistent for you know, the three years leading into um, the pandemic, 100 days. And then if we go to the next slide, looking at um, how we compared to those peer states that we mentioned, which is really sort of a peer population that they created from those peer states. Um, Vermont is here in purple. The peer states are in that gray color. And the question here is how many um, of these individuals were able to schedule a follow-up visit within 14 days, 28 days, and 60 days. So for 14 days, 22% of these of this population was able to schedule a visit in Vermont, uh, 27%, so a greater percentage in the peer states. Uh, 28 days, 34% of those in the Vermont population were able to schedule a follow-up visit that would have them be seen within 28 days. Uh, that was 43 days, or 30, 43% rather, um, for the peer states. Uh, and then 60 days, 50% uh, of Vermonters were able to get seen within 60 days. Uh, but in the peer states, it was 63% of that population. So basically, you know, again, what, what this is, 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 is telling us and showing us is that of, uh, you know, of those um, specialties that were being referred to in Vermont, uh, fewer people were able to get appointments quickie, quicker uh, relative to uh, the peer states that were able to see, you know, visit, we're able to see their specialists uh, at a greater percentage more quickly. So this is pre-COVID. It's a little, you know, it's from 2019 is the most recent year. Um, so that, you know, is something for us to, to keep in mind in terms of limitation. It's also this subset of a population, not sort of the broad Vermont population, but I do think, and Oliver Wyman believed it was a, a strong representative sample, you know, of, um, you know, of the uh, Vermont population, and particularly those that would need uh, care uh, as well. So looking also, you know, putting to the side on this chart, uh, 2020 data, because that certainly was disrupted due to COVID uh, and the, um, the inability for many people to see their doctor early on in the pandemic and go to the hospital. Uh, but if you just look at the other years leading up to COVID, uh, we do see that um, the utilization among specialists and primary care physicians appeared pretty stable in Vermont. It did decrease even uh, in uh, in the primary care, or sorry, in specialty care situation, really stable in the primary care. Uh, so that utilization actually decreased uh, on the specialty side uh, and, uh, and primary care remained steady. So those wait times were being seen uh, basically even absent a dramatic increase in utilization from the Vermont population is sort of the point to be made there. So if we go to the next slide, I think this will uh, overview our secret shopper program. And if we go to the next one, Isaac, uh, this is again, a representation on the right about where the calls were made um, both in Vermont and in surrounding uh, communities where uh, individuals from Vermont will seek care. So Western Massachusetts, parts of New York, 
uh, and then a lot of the um, care being seen across the Connecticut River along the Vermont and New Hampshire border uh, as well. So a thousand phone calls were made to uh, specialty clinics uh, in Vermont. There were 400 uh, unique specialty practices that were called, uh, representing about 90% of Vermont specialty providers for those specialties that we focused on. Um, each of the uh, providers was called uh, twice. Once the caller was calling as a Medicaid uh, insurance individual, uh, the other call, they were being called as a Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont uh, commercial insurance individual. Um, and we called 21 different specialties. That was the, uh, the scope in terms of the difference in specialties uh, as well. So again, this was, was the goal here was to try to replicate as closely as possible uh, the experience of a Vermonter uh, seeking to make a new patient appointment uh, with a specialist for non-emergent medical issue. So for each of those 21 specialists, um, obviously, the reason for seeing the specialist was different when you went from one type of specialist to another, but the reason that they were seeing the specialist within each of those specialties was the same. Uh, we had the same, uh, you know, non-urgent medical issue that we were calling um, each of those specific specialties uh, for. Um, and we tried to, again, design the, the, the um, wait time study as close to this national survey that's been conducted by a firm, Merritt Hawkins, that tries to assess wait times across the country for metro areas. Um, they do this on a regular basis every three or four years. They're in the process of doing it again. Uh, right before the this will speak. Um, so that was the focus and the, and the goal of, um, of, the, uh, of the Secret Shopper program. So if we go to the next slide, Isaac, we'll see you know, some of the initial results. So one thing that we saw that was favorable news was that the vast majority of specialists were accepting new patients. 85% of those that we called were accepting uh, new patients. 15% were not. Uh, so in terms of just being able to get your foot in the door by, accept, by establishing yourself with a new specialty, you know, that generally uh, seemed to be something that was uh, able to be done by Vermonters, you know, if you were to call today. Uh, on the next slide, Isaac, we'll see you know, another thing that was favorable, um, that the difference between those with commercial insurance and those with Medicaid uh, were really uh, not that much of a significant difference. And in fact, the Medicaid uh, wait times were shorter than the commercial wait times. So again, I think another thing that was favorable here, uh, this, this isn't, this, these were not necessarily the results that were conducted by that national firm when they looked at the difference between commercial and Medicaid and Medicare insurance, uh, that they were concerned that those with Medicaid had longer wait times. Um, we did not find that, at least through the secret shopper program, uh, in terms of um, the types of insurance. And there was some analysis done by Oliver Wyman as well that is a reinforcing of this finding also. So I think this is a favorable finding uh, as it relates to um, not finding that uh, considerable difference between the types of insurance that a Vermonter has. So looking, you know, by specialty, as I mentioned, um, this includes um, the average wait time for all specialists, both uh, those uh, in Vermont and out of Vermont in the contiguous counties. Uh, you can see that the average across all of them uh, was um, 54 days, um, but by specialty, there were differences uh, so you can see dermatology, that is uh, one that's often cited as having longer wait times, 109 days, uh, general surgery on the other end, 27 days. Now, one thing that, you know, we need to certainly point out, um, both between specialists and even within them, uh, is that, you know, 109 days might be totally appropriate uh, for dermatology if everyone that needs to be seen within a week or two weeks is being seen within a week or two weeks. And everyone that does not need to be seen until six months is not being seen within six months. That, that sort of, um, you know, that speed in which somebody is being seen and triaged uh, is critical. And that was not being measured uh, in the secret shopper program. However, when we did conduct our provider surveys and provider listening sessions and, 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 tried to get other data sources, we didn't necessarily have confidence that in all 
situations that was able to be done, that triaging where you can ensure that those that need care quickly are being seen and those that uh, can be seen later are being put off for a later appointment. Um, obviously, it's happening uh, in, in certain specialties and certain offices, but we didn't have we had a sense that it was not happening uniformly across the system, uh, which was something else uh, for us to take note of. So if we go to the next slide, Isaac, just looking at, um, you, you know, I guess this is the, I guess the first one was the, I guess this one is just for Vermont rather, sorry. So the first one included all the contiguous counties. This one here includes just Vermont. So it excludes New York, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. And you can see when we do that, the wait times do go up. Uh, so generally, you know, the wait times were shorter in New Hampshire and um, the other uh, medical providers based in Massachusetts and, and New York uh, when looked collectively. So instead of 109 days, it was 140 days for dermatology um, and so on and so forth. And, and the average went from 54 up to 61. So again, uh, when we look within each of those specialties, um, you can see you know, quite a range between what was the shortest wait time, what was the average wait time, uh, and then what was the longest wait time. Uh, so looking at dermatology again, just as the most dramatic example, the average was 109 days in, uh, across all of the specialties. Um, but there were some instances where somebody could get in in 11 days, there were others where it would take 410 days, again, calling for the same reason. So I think this was another thing that made us take note. Um, you can see on the left where the green is, you know, there were appointments available for individuals if they called the right place. And I guess, you know, the other consideration is if they were able to travel, uh, if it was outside of their, you know, outside of their um, community. But there were appointments that were available in all of these relatively quickly. Um, but the average was much longer and those outliers were much longer. So you could imagine an individual calling an, a, a provider and getting uh, for neurology and getting a 305 day wait time and being discouraged and not realizing if they called another provider, it would have been only an 11 day wait uh, to see them for that same reason they were calling. So again, I think this showed to us another reason why tracking wait times and trying to provide this information to to um, patients for them to be able to make uh, more informed decisions about where they can seek care more quickly, um, I think is an important thing for us that are uh, as policymakers. Uh, it would also help distribute, you know, the demand on these services and hopefully reduce um, those outlier wait times and wait times um, across the board uh, as well. So if we go to the, the next slide, Isaac, I think this is just looking at, um, I'm not sure if the slide switched or not, but if we go to the next, if we go to the next slide, this is looking at uh, the hospital, uh, hospitals in particular, um, and looking at the fact that uh, there were also differences between the hospitals within Vermont. These are all of the specialties that were provided at each of the hospitals bundled up and just average per location. Uh, so some of these hospitals obviously provide a different type of specialty mix than others. Some provide all of the specialties that we looked at. So for example, Dartmouth-Hitchcock provided all of the specialties that we looked at. Uh, Springfield Hospital only provided a subset of them. Um, so you can see again, differences here, uh, UVM off to the right, um, Springfield, Gifford, Brattleboro, you know, off to the left. And again, it, it doesn't, this is, this is, does not mean definitively that, that one is, um, is doing a better job than the other. You know, there are these specialty provider mix issues, but it was a way of trying to quantify the experience of a, of a Vermonter calling and trying to make, you know, these specialty appointments and, and what they were seeing and what they were experiencing. It also, at least in the case of UVM, would, um, you know, verify the anecdotal information to some degree that we were hearing that maybe there was um, a significant pressure on specialty care uh, at UVM, you know, relative to some of the other hospitals. So, um, you know, that is, it is what the data showed, at least when, when looking at the wait times, uh, um, you know, secret shopper data. So if we go to the, the next slide, we'll um, look at how, at least for these three, these four different specialties that we're able to identify um, and how they matched up both with um, 
the secret shopper data that was conducted for medium size or mid-sized metros by Merritt Hawkins in 2017, and also by the Veteran Affairs Administration and the wait times that are being experienced in Vermont and surrounding clinics. So again, the limitation here is that the Merritt Hawkins data, um, you know, coming for Albany, Manchester, New Hampshire, Hartford, Connecticut, that was all collected in 2017. The data that we collected was in December, primarily in December of 2021. Uh, so it was pre-Omicron surge, but it was during the pandemic. Uh, so that was the most recent data for Merritt Hawkins. Um, so they're coming out with another survey in the next number of months, interested to see what the results are there. Uh, but you can see for some of the specialties, Vermont and uh, the Burlington metro area, you know, perform uh, pretty consistently. Uh, with uh, the VA and with other uh, mid-sized metros, and then others like cardiology um, and dermatology, uh, we appear to be an outlier when it comes to those um, those specialties. So these, this was trying to get as much of an apples to apples comparison as we could. Um, you know, it's Burlington Metro compared to some of these other Northeast Metro areas. Um, but again, the time difference couldn't be accounted for. This was pre-COVID for the other areas, um, but during COVID for the Vermont data. So looking at the last uh, series of analyses that we did, this primary care uh, chart audit uh, from the Blueprint for Health program, uh, you know, some of the um, uh, Blueprint for Health um, employees and staff were able to go in and look at a chart, do a chart audit uh, for, uh, you know, a number of uh, charts, uh, I think it was about 3,000 or so, uh, trying to understand, again, the length of time between when a referral was made from a primary care specialist uh, to when those specialty uh, services and appointments were able to take place. So that was the approach similar to Oliver Wyman, um, but this was uh, looking at a, a different subset of patients than the Oliver Wyman approach, um, looking at a chart audit rather than aggregated claims data. So if we go to the next slide uh, here, Isaac, it just shows the results of the, um, of the Blueprint for Health audit. Uh, looks like the average wait time, 61.5 days, pretty similar to what the, um, you know, to what the Secret Chopper program found, you know, in Vermont, it was 64 days. If you remember uh, for the entire area, it was uh, 55 days. Uh, and then some of the specialties match up in terms of the length of the wait time. Others um, seem to do better on this analysis than others. Um, but again, if you look off to the right, some, some long wait times for uh, certain of those specialties. And, and we would like to really have confidence that those that need to be seen within a very short period are being seen and those that can wait longer uh, are able to do so, but didn't weren't able to weren't able to quantify that uh, through the three different analyses that we did, unfortunately, something um, that I think needs greater, greater examination and consideration. And then, uh, Isaac, if we go to the last slide here, just looking at uh, the percent of practices accepting uh, new patients and Medicaid patients by specialty. We mentioned earlier that there were, uh, you know, 85 percent of the specialties that were accepting new medic or new patients period. Um, this was just looking at if there are any differences between um, patients that had commercial insurance and those with Medicaid. And um, generally across the board, uh, there were not material differences that, uh, you know, it was pretty strong um, number of practices accepting new patients and new patients, both for commercial insurance and those accepting Medicaid. So again, another, I think, favorable finding of the report that there were not any um, material differences in terms of wait times or in terms of accessing care based on your insurance type. Uh, however, there were issues around accessing care in a timely way um, based on these three different analyses uh, for all Vermonters, regardless of insurance type, for certain specialties when they were uh, looking to access care. So Isaac, I think we go to the last slide. I, I, um, I think... Uh, you know, sort of some of the, the key findings here. Um, we've went through most of those already at this point. Um, you know, the first analysis with Oliver Wyman, approximately half of specialties, the wait times were over two months. Um, 
you know, wait times were long prior to the COVID-19 pandemic based on that Oliver Wyman analysis showing, uh, you know, each of the years between 17 and 19 having a hundred plus uh, day wait time, uh, at least under those chronically ill patients that uh, they looked at. Certainly wait times vary significantly uh, by specialty and within specialty. Um, some of the specialties, neurology, psychiatry, endocrinology, dermatology with some of the longest waits, uh, depending on the analysis. Um, and then I think also we found that certain ways of measuring um, wait times did not necessarily reflect the actual patient experience of care. So uh, using approaches such as the first and third next available appointments uh, might not uh, actually um, capture the amount of time that an individual does have to wait um, for that specialty care visit. And again, no appreciable differences between Medicaid uh, and commercial in insurance. So I will turn it back over to Ina now to go through the uh, recommendations. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Commissioner Pijak. Um, as we move through the recommendations, I think you may want to elaborate on some of the first key recommendations we have. But um, before before doing that, um, relative to the analysis and the analyses that that we undertook in this project, I do want to um, thank those providers that uh, participated um, in this work alongside uh, this team in studying this issue. And I also want to thank the Blueprint team, which did um, provide the study design for the chart review um, in, in determining what the length of time was between when a referral was made and when a specialty appointment was set. And the Blueprint team worked with quality improvement facilitators and program managers in the Blueprint practices to um, design this study, to collect this information. Um, and as I talk about the recommendations have since been uh, working um, to understand the outcomes of these analyses and to consider approaches um, for quality improvement relative to primary and specialty care access. If we could go to the first um, slide of recommendations, however, um, we, we I do note that um, mental uh, in in this in this study, and as we indicated, based on the information that we were um, that we were hearing from those who are contributing feedback in provider. Uh, forums as well as public forums and public comment. We did focus this assessment on specialty care, as you've heard. We, we have recommendations for further work in the arena of mental health specifically, as well as primary care. Uh, but first, I want the mental health recommendations are for completing um, a mental health and substance use disorder services access assessment implementing healthcare workforce development strategic plan recommendations that are specific to mental health and substance use disorder services. And these include evaluating the opportunities that we have in the state of Vermont to address the barriers to licensure for clinicians, as well as we have already uh, signaled to our partners in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that we would like to see Medicare reimburse at parity with Medicaid, licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselors, licensed clinical mental health counselors, licensed psychologists, licensed psychiatric nurses, and licensed marriage and family counselors so that we can improve the access that Medicare uh, beneficiaries specifically have uh, to services by these license types, as well as improve access on the whole by being able to uh, better serve uh, Vermonters with the most appropriate um, mental health care. And finally, we also recommend that the Department of Mental Health in collaboration with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, VAS, should study the potential to establish and offer a statewide telepsychiatry program in Vermont emergency departments specifically to address uh, mental health, to, to address mental health um, need. 
And so those, those recommendations, again, are ones that are already existing in the workforce development strategic plan. And through this work, we would emphasize the importance of uh, carrying through these recommendations. So on, on these recommendations, I'll just for these quickly. Um, you know, <clears throat> these are some new initiatives, tracking and reporting, hospital review of wait times, and then coordination. So, you know, on the tracking and reporting, you know, we mentioned seven days um, earlier as sort of something that I caused, um, you know, caused some action here in terms of uh, formulating the team between BFR, AHS, and the Fremont Care Board. You know, but there was there was really strong reporting from the Burlington Free Press back in 2017 that looked at this issue of um, of wait times, and the stories were really actually remarkably similar. Uh, talking about uh, individuals that you know face you know months to get care, uh, who were you know in pain and were suffering, and and that <clears throat> there was an issue and that it needed to be addressed. So that was a five year period of difference and. You know, the, the most recent reporting, this study does find that it still appears to be an issue in, in Vermont. Um, so our point with that is just that if we're not tracking it, um, if we're not reporting on it regularly, and by we, I just mean every stakeholder in Vermont, whether it's, whether it's government or hospitals, um, then it's really hard for us to know whether it is a problem, uh, whether it's a problem that's increasing, whether it's a problem that's decreasing and getting better. Um, and that really um, was one of the primary recommendations here about developing um, a re and tracking uh, wait times. So we have here a request to the Vermont legislature, but the, you know, the tack that, that we want to take at, at the department is to examine our own regulatory authority that exists now um, within the department. Uh, once the legislative session ends, we want to work with the stakeholders um, you know, this, this process that we conducted, obviously stakeholders had engagement and, and provided us information, um, but it was initially couched as, as an investigation and we sort of moved that to a study, but the posture of it didn't allow really for the full engagement that we would like to see um, in developing uh, standardized metrics and appropriate ways of measuring wait times. So that's what we would like to engage in with um, with the provider community and, and other stakeholders to try to identify ways that um, we can track and report uh, over time. And if it does turn out that more statutory authority is needed, then you know that uh, will be something that we plan to come back with uh, next year uh, and make the case for why uh, we believe that's, that's necessary. Uh, the other thing that we mentioned here is hospital review of wait times. So we recommended that you know, hospitals establish a, a board level designee or a committee, basically somebody at a, at a very high level that was responsible for monitoring wait times in their facilities and, and trying to um, implement continuous improvement plans around patient access. And we understand that this um, has been work that it, some, for, some, for many of the hospitals, this was already underway, but <clears throat> across the board, uh, this is something in particular with the hospitals that they're taking very seriously and, and, uh, and implementing and, and working on uh, at this point. So we were pleased to hear that um, and that, um, you know, they're, they're going about implementing that as we speak. And then also just talked about coordination, the, the need for hospitals and independent providers to regularly, you know, collaborate and for hospitals to regularly collaborate, to share information, share their successful strategies that they've designed to improve wait times and measure wait times. Um, there was a lot of coordination that occurred during the pandemic that was excellent. And um, I think really just building on that momentum. And I just would be, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, as we, as we talked to so many Vermonters during this process um, and as uh, you know, I personally talked to them, our team talked to them, you know, uniformly they talked about the great, care that they received when they were able to see a medical provider in Vermont. So that was another highlight of the report was the quality of care, the experience that they were seeing, that they were experiencing once they were a provider. You know, we did not hear, you know, I don't remember hearing any complaints about that at all, that they were really appreciative of their of their um, providers and, and what they were able to um, and how they were treated once they were able uh, to be seen. And obviously the provider community um, 
we're just uh, going through two really challenging years and and we're the heroes of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we all saw that firsthand uh, over the last two years in ways that were incredible. But just would be remiss if didn't didn't mention that uh, before turning it back over to Ina for the last part of the recommendations. Thank you. As, as we are advancing healthcare reform in the state of Vermont, we know that um, services are not always delivered in the most appropriate and the least cost setting. And our health reform initiatives are, are uh, driven um, to try to promote a system of care where Vermonters can receive the most appropriate care uh, in the best possible setting uh, to meet that need. And as we look at the wait times for specialty services, it is very important that we consider that information in light of our healthcare reform objectives and in thinking through, uh, and in thinking through how to uh, best provide for the right care in the least cost and most appropriate setting. And that means managing care uh, between primary care and specialty settings is an area uh, that we want to support. And we want to support that in a variety of ways that we recommend here for continued action. Certainly assessing um, access for Vermonters to primary care to understand whether uh, Vermonters are able to access primary care in a timely way, whether Vermonters um, have access to primary care providers, access to mental health and substance use treatment, and reviewing um, improvements further uh, in, for the regulatory framework um, for the healthcare system and determining the barriers for private practices in accepting Medicaid. As Commissioner Pichek pointed out, we do see uh, broadly that um, access, the picture of access for Medicaid covered individuals uh, looks very similar to the picture of access for the commercially insured. and. This is, uh, this is a very favorable um, uh, piece of information and it may be reflective of, of the years of work that Vermont has um, done for its, its reforms and its healthcare delivery system design to truly be payer agnostic. Um, uh, however, for those practices, there are some particular practices um, that do appear to not be accepting Medicaid at the same rate as they are accepting uh, commercial coverage. Um, and we, we would like to understand better the barriers for those practices, which are uh, private practices. Further, we want to support workforce development and prioritize the implementation of the workforce development strategic plan. And as, as you're certainly familiar, um, ensuring that that plan is implemented so that we um, as a state have the full and, and most appropriate complement of provider types um, to offer the care and services that Vermonters need. Uh, and again, I'm thanking the Blueprint for Health team for the work that they did uh, in collaborating with quality improvement facilitators and program managers um, in this initial phase of assessing uh, wait times and further thanking those teams for the work that they have ahead of them in terms of the quality improvement activities that can promote referral best practices um, and care distribution between primary and specialty care. And again, I'm emphasizing the importance of um, moving in our system uh, towards one that promotes prevention, uh, care coordination, uh, and management in primary care uh, when appropriate, and that has uh, strong systems and supports to um, provide for the, the best um, distribution of care between primary and specialty care. And finally, continuing our shift from fee-for-service reimbursement um, to fixed prospective payments in Vermont that do provide for predictability and more flexibility um, for providers to appropriately coordinate and to um, provide for um, care in the most appropriate settings. Good timing. 
Why don't we take the screen down and then thank you. This is terrific. I know that the House Committee is on a very tight schedule. So, Bill, I will open it up for you to ask any specific questions and then we'll ask a couple of specific questions that I think are our time is uh, pretty precious right now, and we're going to have to end very soon. So go ahead, Representative Lovett. Yes, I think we can take a few more, uh, you know, some more time, uh, perhaps a little, little bit after the hour. I know there's a number of questions. So uh, let me, Representative Goldman, you had a question. Representative Black, Representative. Uh, Cordes. Cordes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's let's do be aware of our time. Uh, because we do have other commitments this morning as well. So uh, good morning and thank you so much. I was looking through your report and particularly interested in slides 52 to 54, which really <coughs> the, the processes and the referral processes and really pinch points. And I was wondering where that, where that lands. So now that you know this information, who in the system is responsible for the understanding at all these levels throughout the system of Vermont sounds very big. So I'm wondering who takes that on. Um, when you when you respond, can you uh, repeat the essence of the question? Because we're having a difficult time hearing folks. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was that's the slide. That no, I was no. I was gonna. I was gonna let. Oh, I will let whoever responds uh, sort of. Uh, give us the umbrella question and then the response. I think it would help for us to repeat the question too to make sure that we, we heard it clearly. I think that the question was asking if we could elaborate on those pinch points in the referral process that can, uh, that can create a longer wait between when a need is identified and when an appointment is scheduled. Yeah, and who is responsible sort of to address that statewide? So as, as you can, as you can see um, from the information that Isaac is sharing here on the screen that we do have a, a mapping of of these processes. Um, these, these processes are particular to those providers and practices that are offering these services. And, um, you know, again, if we go back to our recommendations, I think that that is, that is why we are certainly recommending that um, providers are, are working in collaboration with, uh, between, of course, specialty and primary care, but also, um, uh, hospital uh, providers as well, collaborating with independent providers uh, to, be, to be sure that they are um, working together to identify these um, pinch points and, and collaborating to um, try to uh, improve on the length of time. So what's, let me, let me just insert a little question in here. One of the things that I've been thinking about as we're going through this, of course, is the comment on prior authorization and you don't have the insurance process included in as a pinch point. So my question is how, how significant was that as you went through the analysis? Yep. Thanks. I don't see a lot in here about insurance, uh, private insurance triage. Yeah, I, I don't know if Ina, you want me to jump in? I see Sebastian had his hand up too. Um, we, we actually looked into that um, to see if the insurance prior authorization um, process would essentially prohibit uh, a specialist provider from scheduling an appointment. And we actually found that it wasn't actually um, a limitation in the um, health insurance uh, practices, but sometimes providers would actually have, uh, you know, implemented some internal processes where they would, where they had decided they would not schedule someone until they received um, the prior authorization. 
but in general, we we didn't find that the the insurance process of prior authorization was holding up the scheduling um, of the appointment or the receiving of treatment. So that's an interesting area to explore if the wait time is expanded because the specialist wants to be reassured that the specialist is accessible to the patient. Right, yeah, and we do have, um, in, in uh, DFR has a regulation that addresses um, prior authorizations, and maybe Sebastian can speak to it a little bit, but it puts time restraints on um, health insurance companies in which they must respond um, to a prior authorization request, especially if it's an em emergent situation. Um, Sebastian, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, in, in general, um, health insurers have to um, render a decision on prior authorizations within a week. And um, if the prior auth is um, denied, then there are internal and external appeal processes. But in an emergency uh, situation, um, those processes can take place in a matter of days. Thank you. Go ahead, um, Bill, it's still on your side of the fence. Sure. Uh, so I think uh, Representative Black and then Representative Cordes, uh, and then I just need to say, I think we're going to need to stop, like, or, or case Representative Black and then uh, Representative Burroughs. Uh, then we're going to need to stop at quarter after. I think my question is very simple. I was just wondering if you had compared uh, wait times for specialists um, between same specialty but hospital based specialists with independent practices. So I, I, I can let Ina um, elaborate on this, but there, there were in, there, we were able to do that primarily, I believe, through the Secret Shopper program. But there, we weren't necessarily there weren't necessarily enough data points that that gave us comfort that we wanted to include those specific comparisons in the report. But it did show. Correct me, Ina, if I'm wrong. That wait times, you know, they were long, sort of across across the board. I'll just put it that way. Whether it was independent provider or um, associated with a hospital. That's, that's correct. We, we observed um, if going, you know, in, in my mind, I have the um, chart that Commissioner Pichek walked you all through with the wait times um, being, you know, short um, uh, all the way up through the um, more than 400 days of wait time. So we saw that wide range and that wide range was consistent um, between hospitals and independent providers, but we did not um, undertake an analysis specifically to compare hospital to independent providers uh, for the reasons Commissioner Pichek named. The, the uh, data for independent providers was uh, not as significant to be able to make that comparison. Thank you. Representative Burroughs. Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I, I'm. Uh, you just need to speak up. So. Okay. I'm puzzled as to why <laughs> there's no data included uh, regarding pediatric specialties. Um, I see on slide 84 that um, uh, <laughs> Oliver Wyman said that Vermont's experiencing a decline in availability of clinical FTEs and family and pediatric specialties, or with pediatric care. And then I also see further down on slide number 95, it's included among um, specialties that were looked at. And I wondered why it's left out of the, the presentation that you just gave us. Yeah, I mean, I, I will just say that, you know, we did, we did note that um, particularly when it, came to psychiatric and, and eating disorder specialties. For pediatrics, there were um, reports of significant wait times. You know, we, and, and again, I'll turn it over to Ina, but we just, you know, when we did these analyses, we would like to look at everything. We'd like to have looked at emergency department wait times. We'd like to look at mental health. We'd like to look at general um, primary, you know, primary care. But we just, we just had to make some 
initial determinations around what to focus on first. So that does not mean that it was a greater priority or a lesser priority. It just was the first area. And we do have other areas that we want to explore in more detail as well. Okay, thank you. Can I, because because of the time, uh, I, I might just comment that uh, some of the recommendations that you've made, particularly around workforce development, I think have been uh, uh, Trying, trying to address in initiatives taken in the House healthcare and the House generally. And so I'm hoping that they'll be favorably uh, received as the Senate reviews the work of uh, healthcare workforce uh, initiatives. And uh, that, I, I guess one of, the, one of the last questions I have is whether uh, the Department of Financial Regulation uh, I, I would like to better understand what authority you believe you need in order to continue uh, the uh, monitoring and investigation or not, or, you know, analysis. Uh, and to understand that if, uh, whether, I'm hoping that you're able to continue this analysis uh, even absent specific uh, statutory authority in the immediate uh, immediate time, given where we are in the legislative session. Uh, and that I think you alluded to the possibility of coming back with some particular, with some additional uh, suggestion, but. Yeah, uh, yeah Chair Lippert, that, that's exactly right. I mean, that's our, that's our hope. Um, and we think we can make progress independent of specific statutory authority right now uh, from the legislature, but I do wanna turn it over to Emily and Sebastian to elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, I can jump in and then I'll turn it over to Sebastian. So currently um, under regulation 0903, which um, governs um, requirements over managed care organizations or health insurers in Vermont and their practices, we require um, health insurers, for instance, to provide an updated directory of all their providers, as well as inform consumers of whether um, providers are, are taking new patients. Um, and as well as the state law, there's actually new requirements in the No Surprises Act, which um, Sebastian can probably elaborate on, um, which require a quarterly update of the provider directories to make sure there's accurate information. So we think we already have some authority, even though it's through the health insurers, to require reporting on provider networks. So I think that would be a good first step to look into that authority that we have to see whether it wouldn't just be you know, the health insurers letting consumers know uh, who the providers are and if they're taking new patients, but also expand uh, into other metrics, which could address wait times. Um, and so I think as Commissioner Pichek mentioned earlier, we want to work with stakeholders, providers, and the health insurers to make sure that the metrics that we'd be asking for would make sense um, and be uh, applicable to all different provider types. And then once we have an idea of what those metrics should be, because there aren't really any uniform ones that exist today on wait times, um, hopefully be able to, through our, through our regulation of health insurers, as well as if there is extra legislation that's needed to clarify um, that authority, um, work with, with the health insurers and providers on reporting that uh, wait time information through the health insurers. So at least if you had commercial health insurance, as well as we could probably work with Medicaid that you, uh, if you are a subscriber, you could go to your health insurer and understand, okay, if I can see this provider, it would be approximately two months and I can go to another provider and maybe wait a shorter time. So um, I think that will be our starting point and then we'll see where, where we have to go from there. So I'm going to, I'm going to I'd like to interject at this point because our committee is going to have to leave uh, in about 30 seconds, but. Uh, just a comment here, and I, I'm finding this very um, thought-provoking, what you're talking about, because it does raise issues around contract relationships between ERISA plans and others that may preclude any opportunity for changes in wait time. So there's some issues there that we bump, we bump into going along. The other area is around the clinical um, judgment that's used uh, around acuity of a patient. So determination of who is going to wait longer and why. Sometimes patients don't understand that, <laughs> I, you know, certainly. But um, 
So there's a lot mixed in here that is going to uh, stir up um, a lot of different issues and concerns that I think have been expressed over time. I, I think the, the work that you have done has, is raising some really important questions, but, uh, and I, my, my, I guess my hope is that the professional judgment isn't going to be um, put on the back burner in this, in this process. Um, uh, certainly, we can't have that. Uh, so it, we don't want it to end up being a contract that says wait time will be no longer than X, Y, or Z when we, we don't fully understand the patient needs. So the, I'm making all these comments because I have 100 questions for you, but I do appreciate everything, the work that you've done and um, raised these issues. Yeah, it, and Chair Lyons, just, just very quickly, like, you know, the, the consumer experience over almost every product that we consume or service that we consume now is wanting it to be on demand and wanting it to be faster and quicker. So we do recognize that, you know, there is that general sentiment that you have to navigate against because not everyone needs to be seen today or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and it might be very appropriate for them to be seen in six months, although they want to be seen very quickly. So you, that's obvious, that is a challenge built into this problem that um, we have to certainly account for. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the, the depth of work that you have done and bringing us report and the response that you have made to the, the public um, outcry. I mean, obviously the, the news article was uh, jarring to a number of people. So thank you for your work. Yes, thank you. I want to thank you as well. Thank you as well. And and maybe one final note that I think uh, while we, we go past it to look at other issues, I think it is significant that there was not a significant difference between access for Medicaid, many Vermonters mm -hmm. on Medicaid than on commercial insurance, which is historically uh, something that uh, is uh, been challenged and talked about. And I think that's actually a significant finding in the midst of all of these other questions that are raised as well. And I think we need to highlight that and uh, uh, to appreciate the work that's been done to establish that as, uh, as the norm. That's, that's, a, that's no small achievement. So thank, thank you all. And uh, thank you, Senator Lyons. We're sorry, we, we took more of your time than we had anticipated. Oh, this uh, is just, uh, I think this is the beginning uh, and we'll have to go through the report independently and then um, we'll certainly listen to requests that come to us from uh, folks. So thank you for your time.